final reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 16. That's on page 195 in the New Testament of the Pew Bible, if you wish to follow along. Listen once more to the Word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. As I've looked around the sanctuary today, and I think of some of the specific people who I know are worshiping online with us. I'm pretty amazed at the wide spectrum of experiences represented when it comes to our callings and where we are with those. Uh, We just saw some very young disciples in here. Then perhaps we have some newer Christians who are at the very beginnings of you know, taking that intentional step along the path of discipleship. There are those in here and online who are very mature in faith, right? And that does not always have to be just because of chronological age, but it can help. It is that time of year when men and women are receiving calls from our nominating team and are being asked to discern a call to serve in perhaps a number of ways over the next couple of years. Uh, I know of someone in our congregation who's been trying to figure out a call that they know has been put on their life, but they just aren't sure where or how or even why this might be happening and where it will exactly lead. Right? We met Katie earlier, who is... In the inquiry phase of uh, the call process, we have Adrian, who just completed the final steps of uh, that process as well. I'm approaching the 20-year mark since my ordination in the December of 2004, and it just makes you say, sheesh, which I know, kids, you stopped saying that years ago, but sometimes it just fits. You might want to take a moment and just reflect on where you are in your faith journey, or this might be the day you decide that you're ready to take that next step of faith. Wherever each of us is, we are all susceptible to doubts, and usually I'm not anti-doubt, as long as we remember that doubt is not the end. It's not the stopping point. Doubts can and should lead us into a deeper, stronger, a more mature and certain faith. And I won't speak for everyone, but I'm just as susceptible as anyone else. And this is not a pity party of one, so please don't take it that way. I'm just being real. All right, that there are those days or maybe even a season where I wonder if what I'm doing makes a difference at all. I wonder if I could find, or if I would find, fulfillment doing something else, like maybe driving around and being a Guinness inspector in Ireland, because that's a real job. (laughs) Or buying a pub and then, you know, running a Sunday morning Bible study out of it or something, right? That's easy to romanticize, but I know the answer is no. I don't believe I would experience the same fulfillment that comes from being who I'm called to be. 
Maybe you've wrestled with that, whether it's with a career or how to best utilize time in retirement. Um, maybe there's the, the college student who is three years deep into a degree and experiences that pause of doubt, wondering, is this the right path? Somehow I went from pre-med to piano to religion and thankfully was still able to graduate in four years. Seminary was not always my forever path either. Deciding to apply to go to seminary, that's a huge step. And the ordination process is started with this phase of discerning uh, that you might be called to ordained ministry, right? It is not definite. The key word is if you are being called. Going through the process and through the rigors of a graduate degree, I think it's common to at least once pause and ask yourself, what am I doing? If you've ever felt or thought something like that, then I just want to say you're in good company. Because I'd imagine quite a few of your pew neighbors in here have had that same experience and so have many of our spiritual ancestors and heroes whose stories are recorded here in scripture for us. It's in these times that we need the shield of faith. So far, our spiritual preparation and protection has looked like this, right? The belt of truth girded around our waists, the breastplate of righteousness. For shoes, wear whatever equips you to proclaim the gospel of peace, Wear something like the Roman soldiers, Caligae, that was their footwear that offered protection, but also gave them the ability to hold their ground. It also had those studs on the bottom that helped them pivot and against, uh, advance against their enemies. And then with all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know what's worse than being struck by an arrow? Being struck by an arrow that's on fire. <laughs> I can't speak from personal experience. I'm just taking a wild guess on that one. Now, especially in those times, the, fa the fatality rate jumped when being struck by a flaming arrow. So just like a soldier would not go into battle without his breastplate, or leaving his belt behind that kept his tunic gathered so he wouldn't trip and fall. Or like any of the equipment we'll look at in this series, the shield was essential. And sometimes when we think of shields, we might think of kind of like, you know, gladiators or others with kind of the round shield, right? Kind of like Captain America, shape and size. But again, we have to remember that the Romans were pretty innovative just like we can be with the correct spiritual equipment. These shields were approximately about four feet tall by three feet wide. Big enough for a soldier at that time to hide fully behind. Right? And in Latin, they're called scutum. And they were constructed of two layers of wood or sometimes even brass and adhered together covered first with linen and then leather. And the genius of this construction is that when a flaming arrow struck the shield, it extinguished the flame. Also, it's really cool, these shields could interlock. Maybe you've seen or heard of the tortoise formation that Romans would use sometimes. They would arrange their shields to protect all sides. And even they would put them over their heads to cover almost total protection. So just as the shield was essential in the battlefield, the shield of faith is essential for our spiritual protection. Whether we recognize it or not, we're always looking for shields. But too often we reach and we take up the wrong kind. 
Now, owning real estate is a good thing, okay? Buying a house, owning a house, that is good. It can provide economic security. It can be a means of growing wealth. I've even seen it done in a way that can be very positive and, and helpful for others, right? It doesn't have to be a practice of greed, but that kind of shield does not offer ultimate protection for us. Similarly, cash is a good thing. It's, it's the love of money that causes all sorts of trouble and evil, but money itself is neutral. We can use it for good purposes and bless others, but that, the size of our bank account does not offer us ultimate protection either. Insurance protects us against catastrophes. It really helped us when our home was assaulted in May, not with flaming arrows, but frozen hunks of hail. If you watched college football yesterday or you watched the NFL today, you don't have to count because you'd run out of fingers and toes, but just take note of how many commercials you will see that have to do with insurance. That shows the scale of the industry and how it knows where and how often to advertise. Insurance makes us feel secure because it protects us against some uncertainties and threats, but it too is not the ultimate protection that we need. So clearly the shield of faith meant something different to Paul. After all, he's writing about flaming arrows. I'm pretty sure if our house was attacked by something like flaming arrows these days, one, the house would probably burn down, so there goes that shield. Uh, it would empty our bank accounts or retirement or investments to, to rebuild and restore, so there goes that shield. And of course, insurance would deem that as an act of God and just give us the old good luck with all that and leave us high and dry, so there goes that shield. T.T. Crabtree identifies several examples of what these arrows can be in our lives. And we have to remember and recognize that these arrows attack us spiritually. He writes, we will face the fiery arrow of temptation to do evil. We will be tempted to do things that are immoral, tempted to place too high of, of a value on material goods and wealth, Tempted to live a selfish life with no thought of others. We might be tempted to do something so bizarrely evil we have no idea where or how the thought came or even appeared in our minds. We'll face the fiery arrow of doubt that leads to disappointment and despair. Right, going back to the Garden of Eden, the snake's tactic was to undermine God, to cause Eve to question what she believed about God. And this strategy exists today, when we're tempted to doubt and question God's goodness, his integrity, and character. And no doubt we're tempted to do the exact same thing with one another and even ourselves. We will face the fiery arrow of discouragement. Now, one of the meanings of the name Satan is accuser. Now, much like doubt can lead to discouragement and despair, these accusations take that to the next level. He will accuse God of things for which he's not responsible. You and I will be accused of not being perfect all the time. We'll be accused of things that we even have never done. These accusations, right, can include slander and malice. Our justice system professes innocence until proven guilty, but too often we operate in a world that says otherwise, guilty until proven innocent. Those arrows can not only hurt terribly, they can kill careers through false accusations. We will face the fiery arrows of personal disappointment that will numb us and destroy us. 
Challenges should be expected. Bumps in the road will happen. We will be knocked down. There will be temptation there for our faith to be chipped away to where we lose our protection and just sort of lie there and give up in apathy. And we face the fiery arrow of personal injury and illness. Right? Injuries occur sometimes of our own fault, the fault of someone else, or just pure accident. But in each of those circumstances, we can be tempted to become bitter and resentful. We can be tempted to become hostile and hateful to others, whether it was their fault or not. We can be tempted to live life with a grudge. Like I've said at least once already in this series, if Jesus himself was tempted, we should not foolishly think that we will live lives immune of temptation and fiery arrows. Thankfully, Jesus showed us what it looks like to be equipped with the shield of faith. First, we can take strength and find protection in that Jesus, as Hebrews 12, 2 says, is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He walked the path that you are walking. He has endured pain and rejection and abandonment and shows us how to walk that walk. The shield of faith protects us from the arrows that cause us to doubt God's goodness and his character. We stand strong, trusting in God's faithfulness and truthfulness to us. Second, Jesus taught the disciples that no matter what happens, no matter the intensity and the volume of the fiery arrows, Mark eleven twenty two says, Jesus answered them, have faith in God. He goes on to teach what faith can do when we believe. And we all have to start somewhere. Like his, like his example of the mustard seed in Matthew 17. The shield of faith is reinforced by those sources of faith that we have access to all the time. Primarily scripture. And then God's still small voice and prayer. And the spiritual mentors that are all around us. And as handy as one scutum shield was for a soldier, right, it did not give him 360 coverage in battle. But when interlocked with others, nearly total protection was provided. And so isn't that the obvious analogy for all of us here? Faith is not a solo sport. It's not meant to be done alone. We need one another. This week, I might need you to cover my, my head with your shield. And the following week, I can do the same for you. That's why we tortoise formation here together. So as much as Presbyterians may sometimes balk at the concepts of a devil or Satan... All I know is that the arrows are real. I have my spiritual burns and scars from them. But I also have a battered yet perfect shield that's available when I choose to pick it up. Whatever doubts you and I may be experiencing today, whether that's with our callings, our vocations, where and how to serve, the next step to take along our spiritual paths. We cannot step into that battle without the shield of faith. And I'll close with these words from Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who who take refuge in him. This week, take the shield of faith.
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.